Hebrews chapter 4. This is a very important chapter um, in the book of Hebrews. Uh, we transitioned last week into Jesus Christ being better than uh, Moses. And tonight we're going to be looking at the rest that God promises through Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that it is a better rest than anything that has been given in the past. And part of this rest is an eternal promise. It's a prophetic uh, promise. And so we are not living in the totality of it right now, but we can certainly begin to live um, in um, God's rest this evening. So let's pray, and then we'll get started. Father, we just come before you right now, and we ask that as we look into this word, that you will help us to understand the, and the desire that you have for us to overcome the anxieties and the frustrations of this world, the angers, and that, Lord, you have a rest that you desire for us to walk, step into, and we may experience a part of that rest now. <clears throat> we can have just a little bit of heaven on earth, but in reality, we will not experience the totality of it until we stand in your presence, in your divine glory. And so we just desire tonight, Father, to see into this now. Help us. I pray that your anointing, Father, would come upon us this night. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's go right to the word and, and uh, start reading it, beginning with verse number one of chapter four. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Now, here the apostle is uh, helping us understand. I use the term apostle because I believe that Paul is the writer of Hebrews. If you don't believe that, that's fine. I'm not going to, uh, because it's one of those anonymous books, and really until we um, get to heaven, we're really not going to know who the writer to Hebrews is. But here we have um, uh, the writer to Hebrews telling us that there is a greater rest that is promised to us than any of the rests that have been given before. All right? So, for instance, when the children of Israel were taken out of Egypt and brought into the promised land, that was a time of rest. Okay? But was it true rest? No. They still had to fight for some things. But they did have a sort of a rest, okay? And then when we come to salvation, we have a sort of a rest, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it the totality of rest? No. The totality of rest is not going to be ours until we get to heaven. So that's what the writer is saying here. He's saying, don't let, let loose of any of the promises of God that have been given to us so that we miss the rest, that the totality of rest that he has. Now, if you have been reading or you know, watching the news, you know that there's all sorts of people that are upset over the recent election. On both sides of the, of the aisle, there are people that are upset. Why are they upset? Because men fail us. Amen. People fail. There is not a leader in this world that hasn't failed anybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we could just go right down the line. On Sunday, I was talking to my son. Adam said to me, he says, Dad, doesn't character... Um, that doesn't character mean anything anymore? And I said, yes, it does. And he says, well, you know, he said, I remember when, when Bill Clinton was the president. And there some, were some things that came up under his presidency that um, you looked at me one day and you said, Adam, from this point on, American politics have changed. And he said, I didn't know at that point in time what you were meaning, but he says, I can see it today. He says, the political landscape has changed. I said, that's right, Adam. I said, at that point in time, 
Bill Clinton was my president, but I didn't trust him. Mm -hmm. And we had George W. Bush as our president. And, you know, when you look back over the Bush presidency, there were things that took place under his presidency that I didn't support or trust. One of those things was the Patriot Act. George Bush initiated a Patriot Act whereby for the first time in American history, law enforcement agencies could walk into a place of worship and listen to what the speaker had to say and make a, determina a legal determination on whether that person was crossing the line <laughs> on whatever the issue was. They signed the act um, because they wanted to get into mosques and hear what the clerics had to say. But at that point in time, I said to people, I said, you know, this is going to come back and bite us because they're going to use it against, they're going to use it against Christian, mm -hmm. true believing pastors who preach about the moral angst of our society and culture, be it homosexual unions, okay, the right or wrong of that, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, euthanasia, do we keep old people living or do we just let them die mm -hmm. or do we purposely put them to death? I said, those types of things are going to come up. And if you're a true man of God, you're going to have to follow the Bible. You follow the Bible, you're going to break, you're going to break law. Today, it is possible in certain states in the union to be arrested for saying that homosexuality is a sin. In fact, just me putting this on YouTube and playing it in those states causes me to break the law in those states. So, it doesn't, to me, as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you are on, we have never had a president since I've been alive that was perfect. Amen. They've all been flawed. And so if we think that just electing a certain political party or a certain political group is going to bring us into rest, we are sorely mistaken. The only thing that we have that is solid that we can stand upon is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's the difference between philosophy and theology. Amen. In philosophy, you are always in flux. You are always in change. There is never anything that is the totality of truth. But when it comes to the scripture, you suddenly have truth. Amen. And I'll tell you what, truth doesn't always make you feel good. <laughs> in philosophy, they're always looking for something to make you feel good. But... Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, first of all, deny yourself. You hear that, Paula? That doesn't Denial mean. isn't fun, is it? Deny yourself. Pick up your cross. What's the cross? Death to myself. First, Jesus said, deny yourself. Then he said, die to yourself. And then he says, follow after me. Okay? So truth has... Things that hurt. Amen. If, if we're not, if, 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 if we aren't reading our Bibles and having things cut off from us, then we're not reading our Bibles properly. That's right. Because none of us stay the same. Okay, so, and that's what the, that's what the writer to Hebrews is saying here. He says, there are promises that are left us concerning entering into his rest and he says, some of you seem to come short of it. Mm -hmm. So entering into the rest of God is going to require some change in my part. All right? But it is the only place in which I will find a truth, a nugget of truth that I can hang on to that is going to give me victory in this culture that I'm living in. 
Verse 2, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Mm. Uh -huh. Wow. Okay, so in other words, the word of God has to be mixed with faith. Mm -hmm. What is faith? What would you say, Jessica? Believing, trusting. Believing, trusting, okay. Even though, even though you don't see it. Blind faith. But, yeah, faith can be very blind, can it? Mm -hmm. All right? So, it is, it is accepting. Now, on the way to class tonight, I was asked, you know, what about prophets? What's a prophet? Okay? We have a lot of prophets in the land that... People that are calling themselves prophets in the land today, okay? How can you tell a prophet? A prophet, can't, uh, you, you know a prophet by the things that he says coming to pass, okay. all right? And, and, and I believe that most often prophets are used in confirming something God's already saying to you. Amen. They, don't, they don't always, once in a while, they'll come up with something that is, I mean, really out there. All right? But that's very few and far between. Usually prophets are saying something that's already confirming it to you. What is going on? And you can tell a prophet by his prophecies. Are his prophecies coming to pass? All right. So... I don't believe, I don't pretend to be a prophet. You know, the, in the book of Amos, Amos opens up his book saying, I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet. All right? Um, I never heard my dad once claim to be a prophet. So I don't claim to be the son of a prophet. And I don't claim to be a prophet. So how do I understand the future? I only understand the future by the word of God. And you know what? It is so interesting to me that you know i have been a believer for uh let's see i was five years old when i accepted christ my savior and i'm 63 so for 58 years i've been a believer and for 58 years i have been hearing that jesus christ is going to return okay has he returned yet no do i believe that he is yes do I believe that his return is imminent? I believe it could happen any moment. But I also believe that there could be some time yet. Okay? So what do I do? I have to live like he's coming back now. All right? Amen. But also live like it's going to take a while. All right? So I still work. Right? Mm -hmm. I still take a shower. <laughs> right? Amen to that. Still comb my hair. You know, because I don't want people to say, boy, you know that Dan Cole really turned into a slob. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, so there, I, I live as though it could take a while, but I live like it could be right now. Why? Because I don't want to miss the promise. Because the promise is heaven. Amen. The promise of God is so much greater than anything that this earth can give me. Amen. This earth can't give me anything. You know, listen, you can be a multi-billionaire and be unhappy. Yeah. It happens all the time. The Bible says that a rich man is never satisfied. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you know what? I mean, if you made a billion bucks, if you made a billion bucks and had it set away someplace, would you be happy with that? Could you just sit by and, no, we want another billion, right? Mm -hmm. And I always heard that the second billion is easier to make than the first billion, so there you go. So a rich man, the Bible says, is never satisfied. So you need to, what is, what am I doing right now? I am preaching. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Who are the them? The them are the unbelievers. We're the ones that the, that the writer is desiring 
to have us believe. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So in other words, faith is not something that's out here, but faith is something that's in here. Mm -hmm. It's inside of me. I have faith. Do I believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God? Yes. It's not out here. All right? The devil believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but it's out here. Amen. He, it's not in here. All right? Do I accept that Jesus Christ is my Savior? Yes, but it's in here. It's not out there someplace, okay? You can ask a lot of people, do you believe that Jesus Christ saves people from their sins? Yes. So why do you live the way you do? Because I don't want to give up my sin. <laughs> See, when you give up your sin and it's in here, then things start to change around you and in you because you begin to change. All right? I can be happy not because of the circumstances out here, but because I have the promises in here. Amen. Good stuff. All right? So I have to internalize. I have to bring it into me. I have to not only hear it, but I have to mix it with faith. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said. As I've sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished on the foundation of the world. Does God have wrath? Yes. The wrath of God has been poured out upon mankind numerous times. If you read the book of Revelation, you'll see that the wrath of God is going to be poured out in, in the trumpets, in the bowls, in the vials, all right? Now, listen to this. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So in other words, God is working from a divine plan. He had this all, he understood all of this before the world was even created. Amen. Before the world was created, God saw you, God saw me. And he has one promise for those of, him, for those of us that will mix faith with our belief. And that is this, that there is nothing that's going to come our way that's going to overcome us. Amen. He's going to provide a way through those things. All right? He provides the path of victory. I do not provide my own path of victory. He provides the path of victory. So here's how it works out. Daniel gets thrown into a lion's den, right? Mm -hmm. Okay? Darius spends the whole night worrying about Daniel down in this den of lions. In the morning, he pulls the lid off from the dungeon, and he says, Daniel, Daniel. And Daniel looks up, and he says, Oh, king, live forever. Isn't that weird? <laughs> the guy that threw him in the, in the dungeon, he says, Oh, king, live forever. He blessed him. I have to think about that once in a while when I think about my president. Oh, king, live forever, you know? <laughs> All right? God, he, what did Daniel say? God has sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth. All right? It's not until you're thrown in the lion's den that God sends the angel. Amen. <laughs> the three Hebrew children were thrown into the fiery furnace. The furnace was heated seven times hotter than ever been heated before. Those that threw the... the the, the three Hebrew children in, they died because of the heat at the mouth of the furnace. What happened to those three guys? And Nebuchadnezzar looked down and he said, Lo, didn't I see four? Didn't I see three men? Didn't we send three men to the fire? And I see four, and the fourth looks like the Son of God. Amen. Wow. Amen. The three Hebrew children met Jesus in the midst of the deepest fire. Now, I want to tell you something. There was only one man that we know of in Scripture that was thrown in a lion's den and lived, and that was Daniel. There are only three men in Scripture that we know of that were thrown in a fiery furnace and lived, and those were the three Hebrew children. I have no idea what God is going to allow you to go through. But I can promise you this. Whatever God allows you to go through, he's going to take you completely through it. Amen. Amen. That's a good word. He'll take you completely through it. So, Amen. these things were determined. God knew about the three Hebrew children before the foundations of the world. God knew about Daniel before the foundations of the world. 
Larry, God knew about your broken hip before the foundations of the world. He knew all those, and he has given a promise, and that promise is this, that he will not let anything come your way that you're not going to be able to make it through. Amen. And, and you know what? It, it's easy for me to sit here and preach this night because I've whined through a few things. Amen. We all do. Yeah, we all do. Because what? Because we forget. That was the problem with the Hebrews. These Hebrew believers were starting to forget. And so this guy's writing to him and says, I don't want you to lose a promise. I don't want you to lose out on anything. <coughs> Remember what's happening. Verse number four. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Where was that written? Genesis. Book of Genesis. The very first book in the Bible. God worked for six days. On the seventh day, he rest, rested. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. So in other words, the writer to Hebrews here is saying that there is a work that needs to be done. And God desires for you to enter into his rest. Seeing therefore, verse 6, it remaineth that some must enter in there, therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in, because of unbelief. So what will keep us from entering into God's rest? Unbelief. Verse 7. Again, he limited a certain day, saying in David, today, after so long a time, as this said, today, if you will hear his voice, hard, hear his voice, harden not your hearts. So in other words, if you want to hear the voice of God, harden not your heart. Why did he use David as an example? Did David harden his heart? When did David harden his heart? He wanted Bathsheba. With Bathsheba. And he Don't you him. think that God gave David some warnings? Well, of course he did. And what did David do? He said, I'm going to do what I want to do anyway. Several people gave him warnings. That's Several true. people gave him warnings. That's true. Yeah, I sat with a, I sat with a young man not long ago, and and I had warned him specifically. You know, he he he, he was engaged to a young lady, and I said, you know, this just isn't a good, this isn't good. I, I really you know I really caution you on this, not to marry this lady. You know. You do what you have to do, but I just want you to know that I'm, I'm warning you that this isn't going to be good, all right? Two years later, we're sitting together, and he's living with some guys, and they split apart and looking at divorce, okay? And I looked at him, and I said, do you remember the time I spoke to you and warned you not to do this? He said, yes. And I said, so why did you do it? He said, because I had six people that told me it wasn't a good deal. I had 200 people that told me this was going to be heaven. You know what that's called? Democracy. The one with the most votes wins, right? Yep. It's all over Jeremiah. Uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> Democracy is not God's way of doing things. God doesn't care who has the most votes. He wants to know who's going to hear my voice. That's right, amen. Now, does that mean that I always hear the voice of God? I'm going to tell you, no. There have been times I thought I heard the voice of God, and I didn't, Okay. But I'll tell you this, I have learned one thing. If God, if I have this hesitancy in my spirit that I'm not supposed to do something, I don't do it. Because I have learned that that's God speaking to me in that still, small voice. There are three ways that God speaks to people. God speaks to people with his voice. I have heard the audible voice of God. I remember one night... And I won't tell the whole story, but I was in a nursing home. A man was dying. 
I didn't want to be there. I wanted to. I just wanted to get out. You know, exit stage left. Okay. I started to leave. I put my hand on the door to leave, and a voice said to me, "You're not done." <laughs> and I, I thought honestly, thought there was somebody in the room. I looked around that room, and I, and I, 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 I couldn't see anybody. All right. And I, I hesitated for just a moment, and the voice said. I want you to sing to him. Now, I thought that was really stupid. Here's a guy laying in bed. He can't move. He's in a coma, all right? He can't, the, the doctor said he's going to die any minute, all right? And this voice says, I want you to pray. I want you to sing to him, okay? And so what happened was I took off my, it was cold. It was a Thief River Falls, Minnesota. It was cold. I took off my parka. I sat down in a chair. I, I, I read a letter. Finally, I did get up, and, and, and I sang to this guy, okay? And, and I started to pray with him. And when I opened up my eyes, he was, there were tears coming down the side of his <laughs> cheeks, laying in bed. He heard everything I said, everything I did. And you know what song I sang? Coming home, coming home, never more to roam. I told that story at the man's funeral. His niece came up to me and said that he had left her house on Thanksgiving Day because they, they stood around the table and the little kids said, I'm thankful for my home. And when they got to him, he said, I've never had a home. And he ran out of the house, never came back in. Wow. And so that night, as he's laying there, understanding he's going to die, God had me talk to him about going to a home and praying for an eternal. That's eternal rest, folks. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> David heard the voice. He went after Bathsheba. Okay. The outcome was that God said, the sword shall never leave your family. Joseph heard the voice. And he ran out of Potiphar's house. And what did God do? God elevated him to the second in command in the nation. It depend Hearing God's voice is important. It's very important. And not just hearing God's voice, but doing what God tells you to do. Amen. And there's a whole lot of people that I know, they know exactly <coughs> what to do, but they what? And therefore they... Don't enter into rest. Okay? So, it's not enough just to hear his voice, but to do what his voice says. And, and when we don't do what, what the voice of God says, it's called hardening your heart. For if Jesus had not given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest of the people of God. That's the rest that Jesus Christ. Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. For he that has entered into his rest, that is Christ's rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Now, does this mean that when I accept Jesus Christ my Savior, I don't have to work anymore? No. Sharon's still going to work at Costco and for a builder. And Eric is still going to put in uh, driveways and whatever it is that, that he does, okay? Yeah, all right. But what does it mean you cease from your own works? <clears throat> well, I'll tell you what it means. <laughs> all right. Mike and Eric put in a landing strip for a model airplane club, right? Oh, God. And the job went bad, right? Yes, sir. Okay, but you're still sitting here tonight, and have you missed three square meals? No. no. Have you made your payments? Yeah. Yes. All right? See, the promise is, is that once in a while, I'm going to do something that doesn't turn out right, but that doesn't mean my whole life has gone to pot. Amen. Right? Amen. And I'm talking about not the kind of pot you smoke, but I'm talking about <laughs> the, other kind. the other kind that you throw away, you know, like, like slum dog millionaire. <laughs> you remember the scene from that. <laughs> That's the kind of pot I'm talking about, okay? 
It doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that that I I'm I'm not going to have to go to work. It doesn't mean that I'm going to have a bad day at work. But what it means is this: is that God takes the bad things that happen in my life and He turns them into His righteousness. Amen. Amen. And I learn a lesson, right? <coughs> you guys are going to put in model airplane landing strips anymore? Not on a swamp plan. Not on swamp land. See, you learned a lesson. Right? Amen. Okay. Or maybe you learned how to do it so you can do it right next time. Well, I mean, you know, it's been a learning curve. Let's put it this way. It's been a learning curve. We've learned something from it. Either A, we're never going to do it again, or B, we're going to do it a different way. All right? <laughs> okay, so you can enter into his rest. Now listen to this. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. It is going to cost us something to enter into that rest. It's not going to be simple. If anybody tells you that you accept Jesus Christ, your Savior, and your life is going to be perfect, you're not going to have any hiccups, no road bumps, and everything is going to be, you know, coming up roses and, you know, sunshine and rainbows <laughs> and lemon drops, okay, they're liars. They're liars. We still have to live a life. Amen. Right? I have a life to live. I'm going to go home tonight to a wife that, you know, is getting better, but for the last two weeks she's been really miserable because she fell and, and, and fractured a, a vertebrae. Okay? But she's getting better. And you know what's interesting about this? Just a month ago... A guy by the name of Calvin Wood prophesied over Rita and told her that the devil had desired to take her out multiple times and tell her that she was done and that she was finished. And he said, and I want you to know that God is not done with you. He has something special for you to do. Amen. Okay? So why did that accident happen? Because... Not because God pushed her down. And I don't even believe a demon pushed her down. I believe that God could have had an angel st step in and hold her up. All right? But God has allowed her to go through this so that somewhere along the line, there's going to be something that she's going to have learned through all of this. Mm -hmm. Whether it's going to get better. You know, she can say to somebody, you know what, I've been there and it gets better. And here's what you do. Or she can say, you know, God touched me. I, I had my back go out once. Once. I, I, people can't believe that, my, that I have a good back. But my back went out once. I was down for two weeks. On a Sunday night, I did not want to go to church. And I was the preacher. <laughs> I hurt so bad. And I was, I would, remember, I'll never forget this. I was staying on the platform of our church. And the lady who was playing the piano said, Pastor, God told me to tell you to touch your toes. Now, that's got to be God for somebody <laughs> to say to me, you touch your toes. All right? So I bent over. I got, Larry, I got just as close to my toes as I possibly could. <laughs> yeah, touch your toes. I touched my toes. And when I came up, my back was healed. I've never had another problem with my back. Amen. Wow. That's good stuff. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. Okay. So God has a word for us. Labor. It's going to cost us something to get into that rest. Amen. It's going, to it's going to cost us something. Believing the word of God. What is it that God's saying to us? Now listen to this. Verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful sharper than a two-edged sword. What was a two-edged sword? The, the Romans had swords that they could cut you this way, all right? I mean, big swords. Mm -hmm. They could cut you this way, all right? And, and you'd be hurt. You could lose a shoulder or an arm or something if they cut you. But in hand-to-hand -hand combat, they had little swords. They were about that long. And they would come in, and they'd cut you, and they would whoosh, whoosh, like that. Mm -hmm. And they could go inside of a person and cut them both ways, inside. Now, what are we talking about here? We're talking about belief, faith being inside of us, okay? Mm -hmm. 
So the two-edged sword needs to get in there and cut what's inside of us, all right? Notice this. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit. Now, Hebrews believed what? The soul and spirit were the same thing. Same thing they yeah. couldn't be divided. Greeks believed that the soul and the spirit could be divided. All right? What is the truth? The soul and the spirit can be divided, okay? But yet they are the same. When you die, your soul and your spirit combined will go to heaven. Because your soul is your thinking part. Mm -hmm. Your spirit is your eternal part. So, here's the deal. What you feed your soul is going to go into your spirit. Mm -hmm. So, if you think it can't be done, it's not going to be done. And that's going to go into your spirit. And your spirit's going to get small. Mm -hmm. If you believe it can be done, then that's going to go into your spirit. And your spirit will be big. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God... Your soul is going to think that and it's going to go into your spirit and you're going to be saved eternally. Amen. Amen. If you refuse to accept that, then you will die. Your spirit will live, but it will be small and it will end up in the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. Think about this. People in the lake of fire know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Just like people in heaven know what's going on. You're not mindless to something. You're not mindless. And that's it's so interesting, Eric, because sometimes people think, oh, yes, I'm under the flow of the Spirit. I'm totally mindless. I don't have the slightest idea what's going on. Uh -huh. That's a lie. I, I had a board member one time say to me, you never know what you're going to say. When you're under the anointing. And I said, no, you know what? I said, no, God, you always know. You have the right to say it or not say it. Okay? Yeah. It's just that if you're going to say it, be calculated. <laughs> Use a little wisdom. <laughs> Use a little wisdom. Yeah. You know, because the, the spirit is what? The spirit's, first of all, a gentleman. Amen. Amen. So if you know that something's going to be offensive when you talk to somebody, but you'd better know that the Spirit's guiding you to say it. That's right. So here we are. The soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The thoughts and the intents of the heart. What we're talking about here is our motivations. What are our motivations? Is our motivation to help and to heal, or is our motivation to destroy? If, if you have something to say to somebody that's a word of correction, is that, are you saying it to them to help heal? Now, I know people who have set out to hurt folks and say, well, I just said that because, you know, God told me to. No, God didn't tell you just to set out to hurt somebody. I've had to bring many words of correction. I've had some that have worked and some that haven't, okay? But every time, well, not every time, because there was a learning curve to my, you know, my learning, but it, it came to the point that, you know, more often than not, it worked. Or if it didn't work, people came back to me sometime later. Sometimes up to two to three years, they said, you know what you told me? You know what you told me? Came to pass. I didn't think it would, but it came to pass. Mm -hmm. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So everything I do is done before God. Someday I'm going to stand accountable before God for everything that I've ever said to any congregation or group of people I've ever spoken to, or individuals for that matter. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. And that's where we're going to pick up next week is with our great high priest. Mm -hmm. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was with all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. 
Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. Hallelujah. That, and we're going to pick up with these last few verses, <coughs> starting at verse number 14 next week. But I wanted to read 14, 15, and 16 for a reason. And that is because I believe that all of us here tonight need to find grace in time of need. Amen. All of us have needs. All of us have those times that we need Jesus. And so it is not an embarrassment to say, Jesus, I need you. I need your help. And maybe tonight, as I've been talking, there's been something that God's been speaking to you about. And you say, you know, I just need to repent. That's fine. You, I'm not going to have you raise your hand or you do, do a you don't have to confess to me. But confess to God and say, God, I'm just, I, I just want that taken away. I don't want anything to stand between you and me, nothing to hinder us. And so, Father, right now, as we um, are in this place and as we are considering this word, I pray tonight, O oh God, that uh, you will help us to understand, help us to believe, help us to see, O oh God, Help us to see that character does count. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to see that in spite of what's going on in this world, that we need Jesus more than anything else. We just need you, Lord. And uh, I pray that you'll help us glorify your name in us, that we might glorify your name in all the earth. Um, I pray to touch Nancy tonight, heal her body. Touch Rita and heal her body, oh God. We just want to say we love you and we thank you and we praise you.